You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. In the dynamic world of enterprise security, identity architects and IT leaders face a major challenge. Growth by repeated acquisitions multiplies the complexity of everything. Multiple IDPs, MFA providers, policy engines that all need to coexist. This can lead to fragmented user identities and policies that create security vulnerabilities and add access friction. Strata Identity solves this. Now you can decommission unneeded IDPs and consolidate the ones you'd like to keep without rewriting apps or disrupting users, engineers, and app owners. Plus, Strata's modular architecture makes it easy to integrate with any identity provider without manual maintenance and coding. Join the ranks of cybersecurity leaders using identity orchestration. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire, share your top identity security priorities, and receive a pair of complimentary AirPods Pro. Offer valid for organizations with over 5,000 employees. Step into a new era of identity management at strata.io slash cyberwire. Crew 8 arrives at the International Space Station. The sky is no longer the limit. What goes up must come down? Space race heats up. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on. Stop, stop. Wait a minute. Wait Uh, a minute. Liz, Liz, why am I talking about the space race heating up? Oh, my God. We have the wrong script. Dave, this is the wrong script. It's the wrong script. We mixed (sighs) up the T-minus and the Cyberwire scripts. This is the worst case scenario. Hang on. I can fix this. Okay, no problem. Just um, take your time. That is a lot of typing just to move one folder into another folder. Liz, is everything okay? Yeah, um, this thing is broken. I can't fix this. I think we need to bring in the T-minus people. All right, well, here, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just call Maria. Hey, Maria. Um, we seem to have mixed up scripts. Yeah, I kind of noticed that. Um, Well, I can move the T-minus script over to the right folder, and maybe you can move the CyberWire script over to the right folder on your side. Brilliant. That works. All right, have a great show. Thanks for your help. Ta-ta. Talk to you soon. All right, Liz, I think we have it figured out. Hang on. I almost got it. Just one more second. No, Liz, I I really think we got it. Can we just uh, let's take it from the top and start the music over again? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. Um, the magic has been restored. The XZ backdoor sets the open source community back on its heels. AT&T resets passwords on millions of customer accounts. Researchers track a Mac OS info stealer. Poland investigates past internal use of Pegasus spyware. The latest vulture banking trojan grows trickier than ever. We note the passing of a security legend. On our Solution Spotlight, N2K President Simone Petrella talks about bits, bytes, and loyalty, how to improve team retention with Yamin Hook of the Aspen Institute. And a ghost ship trips Africa's internet. Today is April 1st, 2024. I'm Dave Bittner, and I'm no fool. This is your CyberWire Intel Briefing. Heading into this past weekend, revelations began to spread about an unknown party exploiting the LibLZMA compression library, also known as XZ, which forms a critical component of the open SSH toolkit used to remotely manage millions of servers worldwide. This manipulation of XZ didn't stem from a flaw in OpenSSH itself, but rather from a makeshift solution adopted by certain Linux distributions to facilitate its integration with System D, an orchestration service. The exploit began to unfold in October 2021, when a new contributor, ostensibly named Jia Tan, 
with no discernible digital footprint prior, began making significant contributions to the XZ library. This development came at a crucial time as Lossie Collin, the project's sole maintainer, was reportedly struggling with health issues and finding it challenging to keep up with the maintenance demands. The arrival of Jia Tan, therefore, appeared to be a timely boon. However, the subsequent appearance of several accounts, likely sock puppets, applying pressure on Colin to cede control, hints at a premeditated plan to infiltrate and manipulate the project from within. By early 2023, it appears Colin relented, paving the way for Jia Tan to spearhead the project's maintenance. This transition culminated in February 2024, with Jia Tan stealthily embedding a back door within one of the build scripts of XZ. Preliminary analyses suggest that this back door specifically targeted the pre-authentication cryptographic functions of OpenSSH, introducing a master key-like vulnerability that potentially allowed attackers to gain unauthorized access to any server running the compromised versions of XZ. The subtlety and sophistication of this backdoor suggest a level of expertise and patience uncommon among ordinary hackers or even dedicated cybercriminals. This was not the work of a hobbyist looking for a quick thrill or a hacker seeking instant gratification. This exploit took multiple years to successfully deploy. The meticulous planning, execution, and subsequent efforts to distribute the compromised XZ library across various Linux distributions indicate a professional operation, likely state-sponsored. The discovery of this backdoor by Andres Freund, a Postgres developer at Microsoft, reportedly occurred almost serendipitously. Freund was investigating unrelated SSH latency issues when he stumbled upon the minor bug introduced by the backdoor code, a flaw that ultimately led to the scheme's unraveling. This incident has sparked a broader discussion on the vulnerabilities inherent in the open-source software ecosystem, particularly concerning the relationships between unpaid maintainers and the commercial entities that benefit from their work. Critics argue that the exploitation of XZ underscores the exploitative dynamics at play, with open-source maintainers often left unsupported despite their contributions to critical infrastructure and software dependencies. However, the issue may be more nuanced. Many foundational open-source projects developed decades ago by individual enthusiasts don't require frequent updates beyond occasional bug fixes. This stagnation can lead to a disengagement, not just from the maintainers, but from the broader community, including corporate entities that rely on these projects. Proposals have emerged from within the tech industry, suggesting enhanced governance models for open-source projects, including mandatory code reviews, succession planning, and service-level agreements. Still, such measures might not address the root of the problem, a sophisticated threat landscape that individual maintainers or governance reforms cannot adequately counter. The XZ backdoor incident illustrates a critical counterintelligence challenge, one that likely falls within the purview of governments and major corporations equipped with extensive surveillance and threat detection capabilities. As the open-source community grapples with the implications of this breach, it's clear that the response cannot simply be to demand more from maintainers. Instead, the onus is on the corporations and governments that benefit from open-source software to invest in the resources and infrastructure needed to protect against sophisticated cyber threats. This involves not only monitoring and vetting critical dependencies, but also developing advanced detection capabilities that can anticipate and neutralize threats before they compromise the digital ecosystem. AT&T has reset millions of customer passcodes after a leak of data containing encrypted account passcodes was reported by TechCrunch. The leaked data, dating back to 2019 or earlier, affected around 7.6 million current and 65 million former AT&T account holders. This action follows a claim of a data breach involving 73 million records, which AT&T had previously denied. The data includes sensitive customer information such as names, addresses, and social security numbers. 
Security researcher Sam Chickenman Crowley demonstrated that the encrypted passcodes could be reverse engineered using surrounding personal information found in the leaked data set. AT&T has launched an investigation and plans to contact affected current and former customers. Researchers at Jamf Threat Labs have uncovered macOS targeting info stealer malware distributed via malicious ads and rogue websites. One notable attack involved a sponsored ad misleading users searching for Arc Browser to a fake site, which only opens via a sponsored link to evade detection. The site offers a download for Arc containing malware signed ad hoc to bypass gatekeeper warnings. This malware variant, akin to Atomic Stealer, uses XOR encoding to avoid detection and targets login credentials, credit card details, and crypto wallet data. Another attack enticed victims with direct messages, posing as individuals wanting to schedule meetings via a fraudulent site. Similarities between these stealers and previously documented ones suggest a focused effort to exploit macOS users, especially within the cryptocurrency sector, for financial gain. Poland has initiated an investigation into the previous government's use of Pegasus spyware, following revelations of its deployment against opposition figures and potential misuse by officials. The inquiry, led by the new Justice Minister Adam Bodnar, aims to identify those targeted and explore legal actions, including financial compensation. Pegasus, known for its capability to infiltrate mobile phones and access encrypted messages, has been implicated in surveillance activities across various countries. The investigation comes after the Civic Platform Party, victims of the alleged spying, gained power. The Parliamentary Commission is set to delve into the extent of Pegasus's use and its legality amid concerns over the judiciary's awareness of the surveillance tool's capabilities and the potential for systemic abuse in surveillance approval processes. A new version of the Vulture banking trojan for Android exhibits advanced remote control features and enhanced evasion techniques. Initially spotted in 2021, Vulture has evolved using dropper apps on Google Play for distribution. It now employs a sophisticated infection chain involving smishing and deceitful phone calls, tricking victims into downloading a trojanized McAfee security app containing the malware. This version introduces capabilities like file management, misuse of accessibility services, app blocking, and deceptive notifications, alongside improved stealth through encrypted communications and payload decryption mechanisms. Researchers emphasize the malware's rapid development and advise Android users to download apps exclusively from reputable sources and scrutinize app permissions to prevent infections. Ross Anderson, a renowned professor of security engineering at the University of Cambridge and an influential figure in computing, passed away late last week. Known for his extensive research in fields like machine learning, cryptographic protocols, and hardware reverse engineering, Anderson's contributions have left a significant mark on the academic and engineering communities. He was a recipient of the British Computer Society's Lovelace Medal in 2015 and authored multiple editions of the seminal textbook Security Engineering. Renowned for his advocacy for privacy and security, as well as his commitment to education, his passing is a significant loss for the community. I had the pleasure of interviewing him for our Research Saturday program back in November of 2021. May his memory be a blessing for all who knew and loved him. From dozens of spreadsheets and screenshots to fragmented tools and manual security reviews, managing the requirements for modern compliance and security programs is increasingly challenging. Banta is the leading trust management platform that helps you centralize your efforts to establish trust and enable growth across your organization. Over 6,000 companies partner with Vanta to automate compliance, strengthen security posture, streamline security reviews, and reduce third-party risk. 
Cyberwire Daily listeners can get $1,000 off Vanta by going to vanta.com slash cyber. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash cyber. And now a word from our sponsor, Zscaler, the leader in cloud security. Cyber attackers are using AI in creative ways to compromise users and breach organizations. In a security landscape where you must fight AI with AI, the best AI protection comes from having the best data. Zscaler has extended its zero-trust architecture with powerful AI engines that are trained and tuned by 500 trillion daily signals. Learn more about Zscaler Zero Trust plus AI to prevent ransomware and AI attacks. Experience your world secured. Visit zscaler.com slash zero trust AI. On our latest solution spotlight, our own N2K president Simone Petrella speaks with Yamin Hook of the Aspen Institute about bits, bytes, and loyalty, how to improve team retention. So Aspen Digital, which is a program under the Aspen Institute, just recently published a new paper, and it's called Bits, Bytes, and Loyalty, How to Improve Team Retention. Now, before we get into the real like meat and bones of this study, this study is the result of work with the U.S. Cybersecurity Group, Can you tell us a little bit about that group, what it is, and how that group contributes? It's an awesome group, right? It's it's a mix of folks from predominantly industry, but also from civil society as well, you know, your think tanks, universities, etc. What it basically is, is a cross-section of experts who we regularly consult with on the research that we do, right? So, you know, we put out papers uh, regularly. In this case, we're talking about the workforce development and retention paper, Just right before this, we had a paper come out on AI and cybersecurity from a scenario planning perspective that was also developed with our collaboration with the U.S. group as well. So that's kind of the focus of the group there. So, you know, right now um, we consulted with this group, but also more specifically, we have a subset of talented individuals that we call the uh, Education and Workforce Coalition. Uh, So those discussions are really what fed the ultimate outcome of this paper. Now, what inspired the team to research and write on cyber talent and workforce, you know, attrition and retention at this particular time? You know, these discussions began, uh, you know, over a year ago. And, you know, as with any of our papers, we're very exploratory in the beginning, right? We look at a couple of different options as to where we see the, the, you know, if think tanks have something that we can call market demand, right? Um, Where, you know, where can we help, uh, you know, our broader community? There was a lack of focus on retention specifically. And, and what that means is, A, convincing your, your best especially to stay, uh, but also being it you know, worth your while too, right? Being able to upskill and upgrade their talents accordingly, uh, making sure you can have them be as productive as they can be when they work on your team. You know, in our initial discussions with our working group and the surveys that we put out into various organizations, we really found that like that was kind of the missing piece. And being able to articulate, you know, why is retention such a problem in the cybersecurity industry and what we can do to address the underlying issues uh, is, a, is a key way that we can contribute to solving this problem. Yeah, though it's a great point since we we certainly know we spend so much time focusing on the gap and how we get more people into the field, but we spend less time sometimes thinking about how do we keep them? How do we, we kind of like give them a, a career journey and a path? What are some of the the key findings in this study for those who may not have had a chance to read it yet? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'll take you kind of a high level overview, and you know, obviously, I encourage uh, every listener to to read the paper as well. So you know, really a uh, high level, right? What is the problem? Why do we write the paper in the first place, right? And it's workforce retention. And I think I'll give two specific stats that we found in our research, which is that seventy percent of the you know of folks in a in a survey have said that they have talent shortages, right, um, due to various reasons. But two of the key ones highlighted are are workload and and burnout, right? And the second stat I'll give that kind of complements that also is that there's a large number of people who just leave not only their companies, but the cybersecurity field uh, more broadly, right? So there's over 30% of of folks surveyed are talking about, you know, I'm thinking about leaving the field entirely, right? And that's a huge, you know, it's a huge waste of like potential, 
right? These people can contribute a lot, uh, especially if we give them the right, you know, training and education that they need to be able to do that. And then there's the fact that off, in a lot of places, the opportunities aren't high enough either. It's one of those things where, like, if you don't invest enough, it's almost kind of worse than, like, not investing at all in, in a weird way, right? Because if you if you give them a little bit of talent and then they decide that you're not actually putting enough into them, then they'll dip. And then you've kind of lost what little you've put in in the first place, right? So there's a bit of a, you, you got to like really commit uh, to workforce development as a project for your company, as opposed to like a, a hobby or a, you know, a side thing. Yeah. And I, what I think is, is really interesting also about this study is that you don't just point to the problems, but you come up with the group has really proposed some not only recommendations specifically that employers and organizations can look to employ to boost the retention um, of their workforces, but you also outline some of the benefits of, of kind of investing in those types of activities. What are some of the, if you had to human highlight some of the, the recommendations that seem to be the most kind of biggest bang for, for lowest buck or what would those be? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think you know, there's, a, there's a, we we highlight these recommendations, and I think we done we did a pretty good job of listing out some specific details as well, right? As to like what we saw in industry too. So if I had to highlight a couple, I would say you know better benefits, right? Um, and what that means is you know obviously people hear that a lot of people just think like oh like boost salaries and like nothing against that, right? Um, I don't think anyone will complain about a salary increase, and I think that's a, a critical part of that compensation package. But also, you know, additional benefits in the space of, you know, educational opportunities, right, to be able to upskill, pursue both internal and external certifications, um, wellness programs that really offer f- flexibility for families, right, things like uh, childcare and things like that, that would really help, uh, you know, not only make the, the employees lives easier, but also help them bring their full self to the workplace more easily. And then lastly, the third one I would highlight is communication, right? In any successful workforce development or retention program, you need to have well-designed spaces for feedback, right? And there's not like a magic way to do it. I think every every company is going to have their own focus, but obviously surveys can be a big part of that, especially if you have a particularly large uh, organization, but also, you know, office hours and things like that too. And the last thing I'll, I'll add to that piece there is that communications has to have action, like linked to it. So that's, that's kind of the high-level solutions. That brings up another great point. What are the benefits of of kind of taking and implementing some of these recommendations? And what do employers, like what will they get out of, what's the return on their investment if they take some of these recommendations and put them into action? And is it something that they were seeing that there is some desire to get behind? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, to me, like when, whenever whenever we work on any paper, it's sort of my thinking has always been like, let's appeal to like people's self-interest, right? So what we found in our conversations is it's very specific, you know, tangible benefits to doing this kind of work, right? Obviously, there's the aspect that you save money, right? From a cost perspective. Uh, if people leave, you have to replace them. You have to spend more time, you know, training and upskilling. In a lot of cases, it takes quite a while before someone even generates enough value to offset that cost, right? So you want to be able to make sure you do that. Um, the second is obviously like these kinds of growth opportunities, especially the ones around education, uh, they improve people's productivity, right? So you're also getting more out of your team. So being able to create that environment is very critical too. Really what this gets at is not just the improvements in productivity, but also resilience, right? Um, your organization will be more nimble if you're able to create these kinds of programs that help uh, employees operate more effectively. But to be clear, because you said this point at the beginning, you have to kind of make a concerted investment in in actually doing it and doing it right. The reason I, I point that out, because I think about how many companies and employers I've spoken to and worked with over the past where they say, well, we got feedback from employees. We saw that the satisfaction survey was very low. They said they didn't have access to training. So like, we just said like, hey, we're going to give everyone a stipend and then we don't track or encourage or direct like how it's used. It just becomes like, hey, we think we we answered what you wanted because we threw money at the problem, but we didn't actually kind of provide any direction along with it. Is it fair to say like that's that's a, a good step, but that's probably not kind of getting to where you guys are recommending? No, I mean, that's, that's a that's a great point. I, I, I you know, my own experience kind of comports with this, right? Like, 
when you're when you're consulting for projects in cybersecurity, especially in this space, you always provide like a very clear like roadmap about how to like implement these changes in a in a thoughtful way, right? And and clients that don't do that will end up feeling like, well, like this isn't getting me what I wanted. And it's like, well, you didn't you didn't do the right things in the first place, right? Um, so it's on you. You know, in our paper at the very end, we we actually highlight, right, like what constitutes a good program. And we do that in from both an abstract perspective and a concrete one. Um, you have to be able to track these things uh, to be able to understand whether or not they're working. You can find a link to the Aspen Institute's report in our show notes. Everybody, want to take a few minutes here and talk about our sponsor, Splunk. You know, you need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. And finally, we have the unlikely tale of the Rubimar, a seemingly inconspicuous cargo ship which became the centerpiece of a significant cybersecurity saga. As told by Wired, back in February, the ship fell prey to a missile attack in the strategic Bab al-Mandeb Strait, orchestrated by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. After the attack, the Rubimar, now crippled and crewless, was left to the mercy of the sea currents. The vessel's trailing anchor turned into an instrument of cyber destruction when it damaged three critical internet cables laid on the sea floor. This damage resulted in a significant drop in internet connectivity, affecting millions of users from the shores of East Africa to the bustling cities of Vietnam. The story of the Rubimar serves as a cautionary tale about the vulnerabilities of our global connectivity and the need for vigilance and protection against both conventional and unconventional threats. The incident not only disrupts Internet service, but also presents a complex puzzle involving maritime navigation, international politics, and cybersecurity, illustrating the challenges of safeguarding critical infrastructure in an increasingly interconnected world. Undersea cables, anchors dragging through them, sharks gnawing on them, submarines tapping into them. Where's Aquaman when you need him? And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast, where I contribute to a regular segment on Jason and Brian's show every week. You can find Grumpy Old Geeks where all the fine podcasts are listed. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producers are Jennifer Iben and Brandon Karp. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. A special tip of the hat to Liz Stokes and Trey Hester for producing our April Fool's segment and to our T-minus colleagues for playing along. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. From dozens of spreadsheets and screenshots to fragmented tools and manual security reviews, managing the requirements for modern compliance and security programs is increasingly challenging. 
Banta is the leading trust management platform that helps you centralize your efforts to establish trust and enable growth across your organization. Over 6,000 companies partner with Vanta to automate compliance, strengthen security posture, streamline security reviews, and reduce third-party risk. CyberWire daily listeners can get $1,000 off Vanta by going to vanta.com slash cyber. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash cyber. Cyber. 